I, I, you know, um, I, I always like, who am I to make a film on, on someone I, I didn't meet? You know, I tried the best of who I am, you know, and with the, the informations I had to transmit her story and to, you know, and it's a, a you take a lot of uh, things from here and there and my Jewish stepfather, you know, who's like my dad and, 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 um, and how does it, you know, come bring to life, but to have Ginny with us, you know, she's the legacy. She, she's, you know, uh, the daughter and she, she knows a lot. And now what G uh, Ginny does, you know, in her day-to-day -day life, she transmits um, uh, her mother's story throughout the world because it was a story about um, openness, love, hope, and just extending a hand towards others, regardless of, you know, religion, culture, race, just like open up your heart and stop uh, uh, fearing others, but instead be curious. And I think, you know, if, yeah, she's my hero today. <laughs> Jeannie, you. would you like to respond to this? I have to just give one like little postscript for a second. So Jeannie, you feel very much like your mother's daughter. She has, and her husband have fostered 60 children. Wow. 60 children just a little little nugget there but could you please speak to that to this legacy because I started writing up all these attributes of your mom but I'd like to hear it from you you have a website in her honor you speak about her and Louise I love that you talked about love and generosity and that we're all human you know like it's it's very universal do you want to share a little bit about what your mom stood for and yeah Thank you. I, I'd be happy to. And thank you for your kind words, Louise. Um, she's truly my hero and my mother would love her to death. Um, I'll tell you, the legacy that my mom handed down was not one I would ever thought that I would be doing. Um, but it's such an honor to be able to challenge myself as well as the people that I talk to that um, every day, we have multiple opportunities to make a difference and they can come in tiny small ways where you you know you you just open a door for someone or smile at someone or sit with somebody who's lonely you know i talk to high school kids a lot and i'm always encouraging them look for those kids that are sitting by themselves that have no friends that you know are loners um and I've gotten reports back that uh, kids that have done that, um, you know, kind of befriended somebody who was lonely, uh, found out that that child was considering suicide because they didn't feel like they were worth living. And so, you know, we never know what those what those kindnesses can be. My mom used to say that courage is like a muscle, you know, you start small and it builds and builds and builds. And we all can do that. We all have that opportunity. So it, it's an honor to, to find myself in this position. Uh, amen to that. And, you know, I know that you said your mom didn't see herself as a hero and clearly she was, and she did much more than as, as Louise shows, we'll get to the postscript later. Cause it's one of the best, the whole film is amazing, but that's such a powerful part. Louise, could you relay what you shared with me about your opening Q&A at Toronto and remind people who Roman is and what he said about the film and about Irena? Oh, I'm sure Ginny would be much, much better to, to translate, but I can start. Well, the for, you know, at, at TIFF at Toronto, uh, Ginny was there. We had, you know, the, 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 the chance to have Ginny and Roman, and we had uh, two actors, two Polish actors, Alexander's who plays Lazar <laughs> and of Maybe course so and Great Scott. Yeah. So sorry, Louise. Explain who Roman is. I'm so sorry. I, I should leave that to you. Oh. Roman, uh, Roman uh, in the story you see in the cars at the end is the baby, you know. So it's Ida and Lazar's baby. Mm -hmm. So and so I on stage came the actors and the actor playing Lazar. And then I said to the audience, okay, this is, you know, 
uh, Lazar, and I present you now his son. And that 80-year-old man comes in on stage, and it's Roman, who was the saved baby, you know? And uh, Roman, Bye. smiling, generous, funny, um, and he said something like, uh, correct me, Jenny, if it's not right, he said something like, you know, when we say to ourselves, when we say, oh, you know, to to make one thing, one thing won't make a difference in life, you know, and whatever is that situation. And he said, well, you know what? One, one gesture can make a difference. And I'm, you know, the living proof. That's like, right. Like goosebumps, you know, it's like, okay, no question about that. You know, he's correct. Yes. So, but he, when he, when he said that with such um, just kindness, you know, it wasn't a judgment or anything. It was just like uh, our morals, just like, this is it, you know, just open up and, you know, it's going to be, it can be a nice ride. And I think you said that he said something about changing history, that Irena helped change history. Mm. Um, just, and and I know you speak about her being an upstander um, in schools, right? Do yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's a challenge um, to, to students in school, really to all of us, that um, we can be an upstander or a bystander. And it is so easy to stay with the crowd, to stay safe and be that bystander person where you know, you're watching something happening, maybe bullying, um, whatever it is. And and it just takes one person in a crowd to stand up and to, to say something. And, and then they get usually get support. So um, yeah, and being an upstander is life-changing. Absolutely. For someone. So thank you so much for that. So Louise, Tell us how you how you came to get to tell this story, how you why you said yes. I think this is very much a theme of some of your work. So if you want to share that and maybe some of your stepfather, that would be wonderful. Well, of course, now you saw the film. Of course, I wanted to you know, tell that story. I wanted to share it because I was moved when I read the script. I was moved by by, you know, that original story. Yes, we we you know, we had so many films about, you know, the Holocaust, and and then actually when I read this, script, I talked about that script, you know, or, uh, to my stepfather, and he was like, okay, and why another film on the Holocaust, you know, about I was like, and then I I, I told you know Irena's story, and he said you should do it, and because it was it, it was filled with light and and hope, and and it's a great message. And yes, the other films I, I did or I wrote as well um, are, I guess, yeah. it's you know, with the interviews I get and with, with, with time, I understand that something that's very strong in me, but I didn't know that. You don't know when you're drawn to something. You just, you have, you want to share that so story with others, you know, because it, it moves you. So there's something you want to share. So I think... I think um, I really I really connect when there are um, when there is openness when you think uh, you have a judgment about someone at first sight and then you discover who is that person and then it's just oh okay maybe I shouldn't you know judge so much maybe I should learn instead. And and of course I did uh, some projects with atypical characters as well. With let's say my film Gabrielle was with that mentally mentally challenged woman who wanted to have love and have her independence and you know to have her apartment, but it's not that simple. Even though you're 21 years old, so and I did a film uh, and the birds went brain down. It's with. Uh, ermites in the forest and then at some point they there's that woman 80 years old woman who's been uh, in a hospital mental hospital all her life but in just it was injustice and she's brought there and it's like okay can you 
it let's give a voice to some people who don't get the chance to have a voice. Yeah. And good. I think it's about that. Thank you. I'm going to ask two quick questions. I have so many more, but I'll open up to our guests and then maybe I'll come back if we have time. Because I hope we can talk about Rugemeyer at some point um, and a couple other scenes. But Jeannie, um, quickly tell us what you thought about this movie and how did Sophie Nelise do? And you didn't know your mom when she was 19, but how did you feel she did knowing your mom and her story? Both of them, Louise and Sophie. Thank you. Um... Well, Louise was my first contact and uh, fell in love with her. And I love the fact that we had a woman producer because she took a script that I knew very well. I saw it 398 times on Broadway um, and off Broadway, but she she made a wonderful, wonderful movie out of it. And the actress that she picked, Sophie, um, like you said, I did not know my mom at, at 19 years old, but Sophie just... And, you know, you have the picture in your mind's eye and she just fit it to a T, everything about her, her mannerisms, her, her gentleness, her softness. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's surreal to sit and watch a movie, you know, about your mom uh, as a woman much younger than I am now. And uh, I just can't even, you know, fully explain what that's like, you know. And this story is extraordinary. It's almost unbelievable. It's it's just what she did, all the choices she made in the moment. Um, yeah. Louise, can you tell us about cast the casting of Sophie? We'll leave it just to her for now. Tell us how that happened. Hmm. Why? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so, well, Sophie, I knew her. Well, uh, the producers proposed. You know, they did suggest uh, other um, American actresses. I met some of them. Uh, actually, I met three actresses uh, through Zoom because it was pandemic. And they were interesting, but I felt they didn't look, and they were more known than Sophie. They didn't look like the photos I saw, you know, I've seen of Irena. And I was like, yeah. And then I did propose, uh, suggest Sophie, but the producers they didn't know her. They were like, yeah, she's not that bankable, blah, blah, money. I'm, I'm, I'm into art, you know, money, I don't know what. I mean, to art. <laughs> okay. But then a couple of weeks after they said, well, you know, she's now uh, shooting a TV series called Yellow Jacket. And there was, even while the shooting, there was like kind of a buzz, you know. Uh, and and then, um, uh, so I did send her the script and she loved it. And then we have an hour and a half through Zoom because she was shooting in Vancouver and talk, we talked about the script. We talked about Irena. We talked about war and never in an hour and a half, she talked about herself as an, mm. you know, as an actor or whatever. She talked about, you know, and it was like, and she talked about her stepfather, who's a uh, step grandfather, who's a um, uh, Chilean who was in a concentration camp uh, in Chile. And she just had made a short documentary on him, about him, you know, and, and, that openness and that curiosity about the other, I was like, she's the one, you know, I'm sure Irena was like that, just mm -hmm. like genuine generosity and curiosity about others. And I I thought physically, the photos I've seen, there's something gentle and, but not only gentle, like um, that she could go, that courage, I think that you know she can be fearless at some point to save others thank you yeah i thought she was fearless in the role too i was thinking about Irena at age 19 really risking her life really doing that but it was also a heroic role for sophie um with that do we have questions from the audience from our guests yes and i'll start with a silly one uh, Irena's uh, supporter in the film was uh, here, Schultz. I wonder if that was his real name or if he was possibly named after Sergeant Schultz from Home and Heroes because he also <laughs> knew nothing and saw nothing. Oh my goodness. Did you hear that question? I did. If you're talking to me, yeah. Sure, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, that was his real name. Um, and it is just a coincidence that it's Schultz from like Hogan's Heroes and that he said those things, but it it truly was him. And um, I just learned in Toronto during the film festival that Roman said that 
Um, the first time that my mother went to visit in Israel, she met Roman and his parents and Herr Schultz and his wife. So I didn't, I didn't think know. that they, yeah, I didn't think that they had that reunion, but they did. So she did get to meet him. Um, so that was exciting. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't gone to, to Toronto. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yes. Oh, can you do that a little louder? Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> um, I have a question about how you got funding for the film and who funded it. Did everybody hear the question? Okay, the question was, Bonsoir, Louise. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> how did you get funding for the film and who funded it? Um, well, I, I'm not the, the right person to ask, but you know, I, I can say that it's, Poland, it's like in Canada and Poland is the same system, more or less. So it's like the government system. So we got, you know, funding from Poland and different, you know, the, that the institute uh, that finance film and and in the, the cities like Lublin city, you know, where we shot uh, the exteriors, most, most of the exteriors. And in Canada, it's Telefilm Canada. And then, the, in, uh, and then they had like, I guess a, a a few private funding as well, but it's a, it's not a big budget. It's very small budget to do a World War II film. I'm telling you, it's like five million. So it's quite crazy. Yeah, it's Twenty nine days to shoot this. So we had to be together. But what was very special, and I think that brought us even closer, tighter the crew because it was a cold Polish crew we shot in Poland. Uh, is that the war just had started just before the shoot. So it was um, the real reality met fiction. And so like the day two of shooting, we were in Lublin, Lublin that's next to Ukraine. And we did that hanging scene. So the stunts, they had to rehearse. But it was quite troubling but because we saw all the uh, refugees walking by you know and will with you know especially women children it's like cliche but it's true and with their luggages and 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 we had to put signs all over the place uh to say in, in you know in in polish in ukrainian and in english this is you know only a film shoot but it's quite horrifying to 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 see that you know so many years before that happened and it was still happening in some way in their country and um so yes it was even more relevant than ever to tell that story especially that story that's about light and hope mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. yes oh yes and then and, and then yes yeah i was wondering how how you got the story Louise, of, of did uh, Jeannie tell you the story or is it a story and if so how much of it was um did Arena you know add to that and did you hear the story here in your life be happy to answer that if you want yeah Amazing. yeah it's what I, I let you I let Jenny uh, tell the the story <laughs> My mother was on the radio um, in Southern California years ago, and a man named Dan Gordon was listening to the broadcast. Um, he ended up being the scriptwriter for the Broadway play and also this play, but he was so intrigued with her story that he called the radio station, got my mother's name, and he used to drive from Los Angeles into Orange County every time she spoke at a high school. And he just he just was immersed in her story and kept telling her someday um, I'm going to write a play. And by gosh, that's exactly what he did. Um, and my mom was, didn't live long enough to be able to see it, but she did get to hear the first reading, um, the applause from the first reading. So he was a very good friend of mine and uh, he has her accent down perfect. So um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Um, it was a passion for him. He uh, he truly loved my mom, and he made it happen. Absolutely. And he wrote that script afterwards. You know, yes, the, he did. He wrote the script, and that I received that script. Yep. So, 
of the same name, but the full the, the, play the Broadway the play was also Irina's Vow. Yes, it, it played uh, off Broadway 2008, on Broadway in 2009, and Tova Felchu played my mother during wow. that. Yeah, time. yeah, she's been a guest of our festival. Yes, I see a hand. Yes. Um, first of all, this was a magnificent film you do. I think it was wonderful. Um, the woman that played your mother was a marvelous actress. The, um, the group of Jews that she saved, how many, did all of them survive the rest of the war? Did, where did they end up besides the couple that had the style? Did they end up in Israel? Or? So did... Did you hear? Did should I repeat this for everybody? I heard it. Did you hear? Yeah. yeah. So just did it was all of them um, Yeah. What happened to all the Jews that your mom saved? And actually, she was a spy, as as we learn, and she saved more people. Um, so yeah. All 12 of them, plus the baby, absolutely survived, uh, continued to um, be dispersed into Poland, into Israel. And, um, so they all absolutely survived and, you know, that's amazing. And yes, she, um, did help feed and hide people that were in the forest and things. So, um, she was able to be reunited with one of the, uh, people she saved, Franka Zilberman, um, before she passed away. And that was special. And then of course, Roman and his parents. So, um, yeah, but they did, they all survived every single one of them. Amazing. Yes. What was the miraculous? What was the miraculous circumstance in which she found her sisters? Oh, it's a story. Somebody knows it. Obviously, my mom was speaking in Los Angeles years ago, and afterwards there was a couple right in the front row that came up and they said, "Irene, we're going to go to Poland. We'd love to try and help you find your sisters." It had been forty years since she'd oh. seen them. And she had tried to find them, but Poland was still under communism. And my mother was still wanted, she thought, by Germany and Russians. She was when she left the, you know, Europe. And so she never could find anything. But when this couple offered, she gave the names, Janina, Maria, Bronia, Waja, but she didn't think anything of it. This couple went to Poland and they were diligent. They checked with the consulates and they checked with every local Catholic church they could find and came up with nothing. On the last day, they had a taxi pick them up to take them to the airport to fly back to the United States. And as they were driving, they asked the driver, could you pull over at a little store? We wanna buy some snacks for the long plane ride. So he found a store on the corner and they got out, they went into the store got their items and went up to the shopkeeper and they thought, let's try one more time. And they pulled that list of names out and they read it to him. Do you know these women, Janina, Maria, Bronya, Waja? And he said, I never heard of them. But there was a woman who'd been shopping in the back of the store and she heard it and she came running up the aisle, grabbed the paper from their hands, pointed at one of the names and said, this one is me. And these others are my sisters. And so this couple was able to give my mom's address to them and 10 days later my mom got she called it a letter from heaven a letter from all four of her sisters saying we love you and we can't wait to see you so we were getting my mom a plane ticket to fly back to Poland she was so excited I think she could have flown there herself <laughs> so. remarkable This is incredible. Yeah. Yes. Do you know how many descendants there were from those 12? Oh. Do you know how many descendants there were from the 12? Oh. So that would be an interesting, I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, maybe Roman knows. He might know. Not all of them. Roman was unusual. His parents went back and stayed in Germany and Munich. Yeah. They they were waiting for passports to go to Israel, but it took so long that by the time they came through, they'd already established a business and things. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, Fonka Zilberman ended up coming to New York, um, but I don't know where all the other ones did. And, you know, they may not have stayed in touch. I, I don't know that. So. Could, could we, we have to wrap momentarily, but I need to ask a question myself. Um, I want you each just to talk briefly about, um, and maybe Louise, start with your decision to include the Rugemeyer, like what happened. 
um, with he and Roman's family, like why that was important for you to include. And then maybe Jeannie, why your, your appreciation of that too, like your, how you interpret everything. Oh, at the uh, credits, the card about Rugmeyer. Yeah. Well, uh, we had conversations with some of the producers were like, no, don't put that card. You know, it's like, we, we don't want to know that. And the audience will be, uh, you know, uh, will be angry and insulted. And, and I was like, yeah, maybe it, it, you know, it's, it's troubling, but that's the real story. And and it's does everybody know who Rugmeier is? Sorry, I just want to make sure. Can you can you explain who he is? Oh, uh, he, he was the major. Uh, uh, Irena worked for him. You know, he was the major. Uh, who asked her to German who officer. Yeah. And um, what happened that he was destitute and homeless after the war, and and uh, so Ida and Lazar, so Roman's family, they, they took him. Uh, for saving their lives. Of course, they didn't know what happened between, you know, uh, Rugmer and uh, the sacrifices Irena made, you know, at that time. But, you know, uh, they, they they knew that. And, and you know, and then Roman, he, it became, Rugmer became the Zaidi, Rome, uh, Roman Zaidi. So, which is like, Oh, okay. They they became so a kind of fa family after that, and for sure, some people will say it's terrible. You know, he made terrible you know things during the war, and uh, well, he didn't he, he didn't want to be probably in the war either. You know, he was stuck there as well. That's one one thing, and for sure, we can condemn some acts. That's for sure, but things. You know, we we weren't there at that time in their, you know, what in what they experienced. But what we can learn is we can try to learn to to live together with our differences and to appreciate and to probably forgive and pr pr probably as well um, uh, say I I I did terrible thing I was guilty or whatever. How can we move forward? And it was like Ginny uh, uh, said, you know, one gesture, it's small and it's huge at the same time. And some of the people at the audience will say it's terrible. Some will say it's wonderful because we need, we need um, love, I think, in the world right now. Um, but I'm not there to judge. That was what happened. So you can judge for yourself. I just hope that we can, uh, yeah, instead of fighting, we can try to understand one another. That was so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Jeannie, can in a minute, can you just do a little postscript to that and, and have, what you take from that story? Because you're both leaving us with so much inspiration. Thank you. I can. I know when I tell the story, I get a lot of gasps from the audience, especially if they're Jewish. But what I found out was, like Louise said, the Hollers didn't know the arrangement the major made with my mom. And so that made a difference. But about 10 years ago, I got a, a letter from the Yad Vashem in Israel saying that the Hollers had and other people had uh, wanted him to become a righteous Gentile. And I had an issue with that because to be a righteous Gentile, you have to do what you did with that form of payment. And certainly he extracted payment from my mom. So I called and talked to them and I found out something interesting. And that's after the major discovered that there was women down in the basement, he never asked if there was men or anybody else. He used to, when they weren't entertaining, he would have my mom bring the women up and they would play the piano together and sing and play cards and things. And at one point, the major was in charge of a factory in town where there was Jewish people working there and they were all to be exported to the camp, a total liquidation. And he did the paperwork to keep those people in this factory safe and not, they weren't sent away. So this was after he discovered the women. And for me, it taught a really important lesson because until then, those Jewish people were his enemy, but it took spending time with them. That These nights where he spent with these three women, he learned that they were human beings. 
And he mm -hmm. learned that they had as much value as anybody else. And it changed his thinking. And to me, it is such an amazing and simple concept that if we could, we could incorporate that in our own life, my goodness, how our attitudes could change and our world could change. Had I known that, I would have put that card. That's how you, you change is by knowing the other. Exactly. You have been magnificent. Um, I can't thank you enough. We all can't thank you enough, right? Thank you. Can I say just hello to, uh, I know apparently uh, Arthur Tarnowski, who did the film editing, who's Polish, came to Poland with us and he did the uh, film editing and so involved in the, into the project. His sister is in the, in the theater. Yeah. She lives in Boston. And so I say hi. Oh. Are you here? Oh, she did. Oh, she's hiding in the back. Okay. <laughs> the person saying no is the person who it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Louise and Jeannie. Our pleasure. Thank you.